was motivated by the need to deal with a very pressing problem, especially at ultra high field, which is the B0 shim. Um, as you know, the B0 shim gets worse as you go to higher fields, and this is a big problem for functional imaging because you're interested in the microscopic T2 star of the tissue, but the bad B0 shim in the body caused by tissue air interfaces will obscure that microscopic T2 star with macroscopic T2 star variations over the voxel, which you can see in this B0 map. And this gets worse at ultra high field. Um, this is just a nice image from uh, John Palamani showing how bad the phase gets in a gradient echo image due to this um, B0 variation across the brain introduced by um, the air tissue interfaces. This also causes problems like dropout. If you have a thick slice, you get this very characteristic black spot from through slice dephasing. It gets better with uh, thinner slices, but you can't always acquire with a 0.75 millimeter slice. Um, it also causes problems with RF pulse design for PTX, for spectroscopy, it's a huge obstacle. And then the application that Larry and Walt, where Larry Wald and I first targeted was actually echoplanar imaging distortion. So this is a well-known problem in EPI that you get voxel displacement wherever you have big off resonance areas in the brain. And of course, if that scales with B0, so does the distortion. So if you look at the ventricles, look at the convolutions in the frontal lobe, they're moving more at 7T than they are at 3T. And here I'm just showing both AP and PA phase encode directions, so you get opposite distortion, and it kind of highlights how bad the distortion is. So how can you fix this? Well, you can use stronger gradients, but that's not always an option. You can use parallel imaging, but only up to a certain point. You can't really go past grappa 4 or grappa 5 very easily. So the other way is to just shim the field so that it's flat. So um, this is entirely analogous to mechanical shimming that you might be acqu acquainted with around the house. You know, in most cities, your dresser sits like this on the floor. In Boston, it sits like this. So if you want to have um, level it again, you just stick a shim under it, and now it's level. It's the same thing in the body. You know, the air tissue interface in the sinuses creates this very characteristic off-resonance hotspot in the frontal lobes, which is a very interesting area for neuroscience. So you have a B0 challenge, you then try to generate a compensating magnetic field that'll cancel out that B0 challenge and give you a flat magnetic field. Okay, so how do you do this? Well, you need coils to generate the fields. And in the scanner, there's already eight shim terms built in. You have the first order shims on the left and the second order shims on the right. Uh, the first orders are just your linear encoding gradients. Now the problem is these are very low order uh, smoothly varying fields, and you're trying to compensate for these very localized patterns of off-resonance in the head. It doesn't work very well. This is what you're left with after you apply the first and second order shims. So recently, people have been looking at other types of shim coils. Um, this is a multi-coil shim approach from uh, the group at Yale, where they use lots of loops on a cylinder that can be driven with different currents and create local field offsets around the head. And then you can combine these fields in a linear superposition to remove as much of this off resonance as possible. And you can see that they're actually doing a lot better than the conventional spherical harmonic shims. So what I point out about this is that it's a non-orthogonal basis. Um, that might seem bad at first, but it gives you a lot of flexibility for tailoring the field around the head. And it's 10 to 100 times weaker than the scanners and coding gradients. These don't have to be strong fields. They just have to be spatially independent so that you can create high spatial frequency offsets. And very important is that these are little loops, so they're rapidly switchable. They don't have a lot of inductance. They don't create eddy currents. So this is great for what's called dynamic shimming, where you switch the shims very quickly. OK, what's the problem with this? Well, you can see that it occupies space around the body where the RF coil normally wants to be. So it gets in the way of your RF coil. So this is kind of how Larry and I came up with the AC-DC approach. You bring the RF or the AC into the same array as the DC shims, that the currents that are uh, driven in each loop to sh shape the magnetic field in the body. And a group at Duke uh, explored the same idea around the same time. But this is just a 32 channel uh, brain array where we've brought the DC current into each shim loop using chokes, which are high impedance uh, at RF, these little chokes that you can see um, all over the coil. Okay, so we built this and we tested it out, and sure enough, it did flatten out the field map at 3T, and it reduces the geometric distortion in, in the EPI. You can kind of see it here as I switch the, uh, between AP and PA phase encode. Here's another example. 
On the left is second order, on the right is the multi-coil where we're flipping the phasing code direction. And where you see the arrows, there's a lot less geometric distortion with the multi-coil shims applied. Just as predicted from the B0 field map. So this is good. You don't get rid of all the distortion, but you can reduce the need for parallel imaging or stronger gradient coils to get the distortion down and improve your functional MRI data. So now that we did it at 3T, we wanted to go for 7T. This could be a much bigger payoff. So we built a coil for 7T. This is the RF coil, and then this is the coil with the shims and the wires added. So we added a lot of stuff to the coil. The question then becomes, does it still work as an RF coil? Fortunately, the answer was yes. We compared our product, uh, our, our service coil uh, built by asthma that everyone uses in Bay 5 with this um, integrated you know, AC-DC coil, and we found the SNR was similar, and the noise correlation was very similar, which was great news. So adding the shim hardware, if done properly, has a very minimal impact on performance. So you can still do these nice 400 micron you know, T2 star weighted images and get beautiful results like we're accustomed to. So, okay, the RF coil works well. How about the shimming? Well, this is a comparison of the field maps with the second order shim, a global multi-coil shim where you shim the whole head at once, and a dynamic shim where you step through the slices and you update the shims for each slice, which you can't do on conventional scanner shims because they can't switch quickly. And you can see that the field map is not perfect, but it's a lot better than it was the second order shims and you look at the histogram of the B0, it especially gets good out in the tails where you're getting the worst geometric distortion in EPI, which is confounding the analysis. So what does this do for the distortion? Here's the field maps for global shimming, and here is the distortion. This is a, a contrast-matched, undistorted GRE. This is the EPI, AP and PA phase encoded with the second order shim and the multi-coil. And you can see ventricles aren't moving around as much. In the deep brain, the uh, uh, medulla and the cervical spine don't move as much. It's, it's a noticeable improvement. But where you really get the payoff is with dynamic shimming. Here we shim each slice optimally, so it's easier to flatten out the shim. You can see the field maps also look better. And uh, just for comparison, here's the same protocol run at 3T. A same echo spacing, same grappa factor, and we're almost down to the distortion that we would get on a, a garden variety 3T scan now. So we're pretty excited about this. Okay, uh, just for fun, we turned off grappa, and if you turn off grappa at 7T, you get this cartoonish, you know, ridiculous distortion. And even that um, distortion, we were able to clean up a little bit. That's kind of fun. So that, that was great, but then um, we actually found that these coils could be used for other things that you can't do with the linear gradients. And why can't you do that with the linear gradients? Well, you may need spatial field offsets in the body that are not linear in shape. And so a great example is um, this application to lipid suppression and spectroscopy that we've been working on with um, Elfar and Jacob at MIT and with Ovidio and Bernie uh, here at uh, Mass General. And so what we're doing is trying to separate the fat around the head and the skull from the uh, NAA peak, which is very close to the fat. And you do this by generating a custom shim that pushes those apart just during fat suppression. And then it brings them back together for the for water excitation and the uh, spatial encoding. So here's sort of the normal shim in the brain that you use during the um, water suppression and excitation and readout. But then during fat suppression, you create this sort of um, circularly symmetric shim that pushes the histogram for the NAA and water apart. You can see what it looks like here over the brain. It's terrible in the brain, but we don't care because we turn it off right after fat suppression and we change to a homogeneity shim for the slab of interest during the rest of the sequence. So that's cool. We can get better lipid suppression. And actually, when you look at the metabolite maps for choline, creatine, and NAA, we're seeing pretty nice improvements over the baseline case where you still had residual lipids they were contaminating uh, your spectra and making it hard to quantify the metabolites, especially the NEA that's spectrally close to the lipids. Um, this just shows that the fat level in each voxel is going down, especially away from the skull. Also, the homogeneity shimming helps a little bit with the flow with half max and gives you cleaner spectra. So overall, if you quantify this as how many acceptable voxels are there in the volume, um, we're able to recover not every voxel, but we're able to recover a lot of these bad voxels that are in teal in this plot. So this was cool. And um, then uh, actually I was talking with John Palamini 
um, at a conference in Minnesota, and we realized we can use the multi-coil for zoomed EPI. And uh, the reason you might want to zoom is that when you only image part of the field of view, you have less spatial encoding burden. So you can potentially image at the same resolution faster or image with a higher resolution in equivalent time because you need to encode fewer case-based points. So people have done this in the past with saturation pulses or spatial spectral RF pulses, but these both bring uh, SAR penalties. They add to the length of the sequence. They're not perfect for every application, especially at 7T where SAR is bad. So we modified a 3D echo planar imaging sequence. We turned off the conventional slab select gradient during the RF excitation pulse, and instead we played out pulses on all 32 of our multi-coil ECDC coils. So we took a, a target region of interest, which was the visual occipital area in the back of the head, and then in the field map, we created a local B0 offset that brings those uh, voxels into the excitation band of the RF pulse and keeps the rest of the brain out. Then you have to actually flip the polarity of that to rewind the phase of the spins, and you go back to a homogeneity spin during the readout. And so here's what these 3D EPI slices look like with conventional partitions, rather, look like with conventional uh, acquisition. Um, this is 1.25 millimeter ISO, which you have to do in four shots. And then this is what you would get if you do the zoomed imaging of just the occipital lobe visual area. And you can see there's just a small amount of signal coming in from outside the target field of view. It's not perfect, but we're, we're getting there. And then if we go from four shots down to one shot with the same resolution, we can get just the area we're interested in without aliasing from the rest of the field of view. So the nice thing here is this is a direct Fourier reconstruction. We haven't even used grappa to get rid of the aliasing. Um, and we're still able to image the reduced field of view without artifacts. So the benefit of that is if you compare it to 3D EPI with a rate for grappa, we're getting an, a TSNR boost of about 20%. And it, there's also some benefits compared to 2D EPI. Um, so that was good news. Um, and it shows that for certain regions of interest in the brain, the um, ACDC coil can create a tailored field that excites what you're interested in and excludes the rest of the brain. So we use this with a um, flashing checkerboard classic visual stimulus paradigm. And we saw that um, when we excite only the reduced field of view, the improved TSNR contributes to a little bit more robust activation, as you can see here on the left side. There's a little bit more bold activity. And uh, just for fun, we tried to excite some other fun shapes of the brain, such as the peripheral cerebrum. So here we created a circularly symmetric shim that allowed us only to excite that peripheral area. And I haven't found an application for this yet, but it got us thinking. Um, so then, um, you know, we're still looking for new applications of these coils, which is why I'm giving this talk. Um, I'd love to get your feedback and ideas on ways to tailor fields in space. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, Cowan uh, proposed a new trick with this coil, which is to scramble the phase of case space. And the reason you might want to do this is that if uh, you're doing multi-shot EPI, if you use all eight shots, if you don't have motion, it looks pretty good. Um, if you only have two shots um, and you do a uh, matrix completion reconstruction, um, you can get artifacts if you miss the center of case space of one of the shots. So, you know, if you're doing, uh, part, if you're segmenting case space, you're not going to have every shot go through that center line of case space that has the most energy. So the idea is to create a field that spreads out the spectrum of case space. And it turns out that a nonlinear gradient field will do this. You turn on this uh, quadratic gradient field during your uh, pulse sequence, and you just pulse it. And this will have the effect of um, multiplying your um, image with a quadratic phase. And that convolves case space with a quadratic phase kernel. And the effect of that uh, convolution is to spread out the energy in case space. And what that does in the end is clean up a lot of these um, residual artifacts in the two-shot multi-shot uh, multi EPI image, which is, uh, which is nice. Um, and that's because both of the uh, single-shot partial case space images used for this imagery construction are now getting a lot of energy from the center of case space. Whereas in the baseline case, only one of the shots was getting that DC component that gives you the contrast. 
So uh, we just started looking at this and we're gonna continue exploring it. Um, so yeah, with that, um, I wanted to thank my collaborators, both the Mass General at Maastricht in uh, the Netherlands and uh, at MIT, um, who've been really wonderful to work with on these four little projects. And thank you for your attention.